revisiting some of the best games of this year with some of the best guests from this past year. I'm Johnny Cullen. Welcome to my favourite game of 2015. Welcome to a very special episode of my favourite game, the final one of 2015. It's been a super exciting first year for the show in the aftermath of starting it with season 1 late last year. 2015 has seen two full seasons, award nominations and more. So to celebrate the first three seasons of the show, I've brought back as many people as possible from the first three seasons to talk of their favourite game again. But this time, slightly bending the main rule of the show. This time, they are not here to talk of their favourite game ever. Rather, they are here to talk of their favourite game of 2015. You'll hear a very taste of guests talk about an equally varied list of games that have come out in 2015. Or, well, most of the games that came out in 2015 anyways. There will be some games you'll expect, some you may not, and some you'll be surprised at not hearing in this episode at all. So let's kick it off with the game that is very likely to be the consensus winner throughout the industry of Game of the Year 2015. My name is Harriet Jones, and my favourite game of 2015 is The Witcher 3. So while it's not the most obvious choice, um, Choosing The Witcher 3 as my game of the year was quite an easy one for me, in that I was actually compelled to play the main storyline and to try and find as many of the side quests as possible. And this doesn't happen often for me, I'm very easily distracted when it comes to games and I want to explore and see things and try and find good screenshots that I can share with people to try and entice them into playing the game. And I found myself, more often than not, just wanting to drive forward with um, The Witcher 3, but also finding myself wanting to hold back to extend the gameplay as much as possible. So while the previous Witcher games I really enjoyed, and I enjoyed the universe, but I think I got frustrated with the gameplay, particularly with um, the second one. But the third one, it just fixed everything for me. And I know there was, I think there was some complaints about combat, and compared to two, I was thrilled because I could play and not just flail around uselessly. But it also made me more interested in the universe as a whole. So while I, I think I was aware that there was books that the series was based on, I hadn't really read them. And I ended up reading this. There's a couple of collections of short stories and then a few novels. And if you're a fan, I absolutely suggest reading them because they flesh out. Geralt as a character, and Ciri is featured, and it's actually really interesting to read more about her, as she's so almost infrequent in the third game. Hi, I'm Alex Donaldson and I am the editor-in-chief of RPGsite.net and I'm also a freelance writer about video games for a variety of places. My favourite game of 2015 is perhaps predictably, given I'm somebody who runs an RPG-specific site, The Witcher Free Wild Hunt, which I just find to be an absolutely fantastic, fantastic game. Now, uh, it was actually a pretty close run thing. There are some other games that have come out this year that I really adored. Um, I, you know, I'm a huge fan of, of the work on Rocket League. Brilliant, brilliant multiplayer game. I'm obviously uh, very much into Fallout 4 for the similar reasons to The Witcher 3. Uh, I'm absolutely in love with Final Fantasy Record Keeper, which is a mobile-based Final Fantasy spin-off that somehow 
managed manages to be really really fun enjoyable and compelling but my ultimate pick is still the witcher 3 wild hunt it's a really incredible achievement i think on the part of cd project red um the size and scope of the world how compelling and and how well the story just grabs you um how brilliantly they managed to walk the line by having side quests not feel unimportant compared to the main quest you know in many games and i think this is true in fallout there is a quite a clear delineation between the core quest line and whatever else is going on aside um in the witcher 3 it feels much less so it feels much more integrated the whole world that you have there feels so much more complete and whole um, and I think that is really quite an achievement, especially in a game of this size. Um, and especially, you know, when the world also looks so damn good. Because the other thing is, often you get one or the other. I think one of the things about Fallout is you do have this sprawling, incredible world. But the flip side is, the visuals are perhaps leave a fair bit to be desired, thanks to all the AI routines and stuff that are in place. The Witcher 3 somehow seems to strike a better balance between those two things than many other games out there. Now, there are places where it draws short, perhaps, you know, I wouldn't say, for instance, The Witcher 3 has the best combat of the year, I would give that accolade to Bloodborne myself, but, you know, they, they, there is so much going on in this game, and there are so many different avenues to go down, even, you know, in Gwent, in the card game, which itself is very, very addictive, um, there's so much to do that the fact that the combat perhaps isn't the very best on the market doesn't really dent that much against the game this massive. Uh, I have to give a shout out also to the developers, CD Projekt Red, because one of the other impressive things is, you know, The Witcher 3 was a good game when it launched, but it was a good game that had some problems. And they took their time and they took the feedback from the fans and they patched that game several times over and it is a much better game now than when it launched. Just things about how Geralt moves and some of the animation priority, smaller tweaks but things that really have made a difference and then they've also gone on to release what I think are some of the better value, uh, most reasonably priced and just solid quality um, DLC of the year. I would also say to be clear that the Bloodborne DLC is pretty excellent. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the expansion they did is truly large and truly sprawling, but again, you know, it manages to feel like its own standalone thing um, that doesn't cheapen or lessen the, the main core story of the game. I'm really excited to see what these guys do next. As somebody who prefers perhaps more futuristic or present day stuff to medieval hijinks, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with... Um, with cyberpunk which seems to have a more dare i say deus ex looking setting um and i'm looking forward to that but to be honest the witcher 3 is a hell of an achievement a hell of a game and i can't recommend it enough to anyone who likes a good rpg out there you know you don't need to have played the previous two it is without a doubt my favorite game of 2015. Bethesda, I've had a bit of an alright 2015 needless to say. It saw the release of the final bits of DLC for Tango and Shinji Mikami's excellent Evil Within. It also saw the release of a brand new Wolfenstein game for Machine Games, The Elder Scrolls Online on console, and the first mobile title from Bethesda Game Studios, and Fallout Shelter. So all in all, a decent 2000... I'm sorry, I should correct myself. By decent they had a big gear. They did do this. It's all over but the cry. After years of anticipation and hype came one of the biggest mic drop reveals of the year. On a Wednesday June afternoon, 
albeit after a day-long countdown before it, Bethesda finally announced Fallout 4, and two weeks later it announced a shock November 10 release at E3. It is the first big reveal of a AAA developer and publisher announcing and releasing such a massively anticipated game in under six months and also doing so within the calendar year. But in regards to the actual game, did it live up to the hype? Clearly, because Chucklefish's Molly Carroll is about to explain to you why it's her favourite game of 2015. Hello, my name is Molly Carroll. I'm the community manager for Chucklefish, and my favorite game this year is Fallout 4. People joke around a lot about Bethesda games feeling buggy or relying a lot on mods, and although I'm sometimes frustrated by some of the crashes and glitches that I experience, I'm not sure that I would enjoy their games quite as much if they were super shiny and polished. So, for instance, the other day I was on my way to a quest location and I found a dead Yaogwai, which is like a big post-apocalyptic bear, just kind of floating in the sky, just chilling out there. And in another instance, I stumbled across an invisible door in the middle of the Boston Common that teleported me into a building that wasn't actually at all nearby. And with these sorts of things, I don't really care so much that they break immersion, because it kind of reminds me that this is a game that was made by humans, and it was made with love, and sometimes silly things happened and mistakes were left in because they created a huge game, and it was so large and non-linear that it was kind of inevitable that these things would occur. I like that I can shoot someone with a 10mm pistol and their entire arm will just fall clean off in this like comical explosion of blood and tissue, and they'll just die on the spot because they've lost an arm. So one time, I shot someone with the same, I think it was probably the same 10mm pistol, and I guess it was maybe at a particular angle, and they just went flying 50 feet into the air. And another time, I was about to cross a bridge when I heard a massive explosion nearby, and I went to investigate, and I found several dead dogs in the aftermath of this explosion. So I searched the carcasses, and naturally, because they are dogs and they don't have pockets, I found meat. Uh, and as my character just stuffed these bits of dead dog into the pockets of the jeans that she stole off of a robot man that she'd killed earlier, my companion quipped, well at least someone should make use of it. I like that because of the nature of the game, I can decide to completely shirk my responsibilities as a grieving wife and mother and take up helping people with their relationship issues and their drug habits. Settlements are something that I kind of never realized that I wanted from other Fallout games until I played Fallout 4. It's sort of like playing The Sims Light in a post-apocalyptic setting, and I'm really enjoying that. But another thing that I'm enjoying on top of just setting up shops and decorating rooms, which is really fun on its own, is the overall tone that it gives to the rest of the game, which is one of just hopefulness, because the situation in Fallout 4 is obviously quite dire. But you just have all of these people dotted around the map who are decent and they're surviving just doing the best that they can. And I feel like this is something that was missing in previous Fallout games, was this sense of hope. Uh, and that things weren't all just completely fucked. So for all of those reasons, and possibly quite a few more, uh, I've decided that Fallout 4 is my game of the year. Hello, I'm uh, Chris Donlan, I'm a writer at Eurogamer, and my favourite games of 2015 are Grow Home and Invisible Link. Yep, 
He did really pick two games. I was bullied by the nicest man in the UK games industry to let him choose two games. I even had one guest before him, who will go on name, come to me before whether he could do two or whether I had to force him off the fence. Obviously, I told him to go and do the latter. Anyways, we'll cover Invisible Ink, his actual first choice before he changed his mind for going for two, later in the episode. But for now, let's start with the game that I actually thought he would go for first time, Grow Home. <laughs> To switch it up a bit, whereas I got others to pre-record their thoughts on their favourite game this year, I had a brief conversation with Donlan on why Grow Home was one of his picks. I started by asking what the contrast was like with Grow Home compared to past work from developer Ubisoft Reflections, now essentially a support studio for other Ubisoft titles, but also known for their work on the Driver series. I think what's interesting, when you look at Driver San Francisco, that game is just insanely charming. And that's the link between, I would say, their previous work and Grow Home. It has more charm, more authentic charm than any other game I've played this year. And for a game which can be completed in two hours, I've spent 40 hours in it. And it's it's this sort of open world with a very compact open world, sort of sandbox experience. It's basically a game about climbing and about discovering the, discovering the landscape. There's no enemies in it. You only die by sort of falling into the sea or falling from a, a huge height. And it has given me more pure joy than any game in years. And it reminds me of Mario 64, in the sense that you get the feeling that they made a place and then discovered the fun within that place. This map is just full of, full of ways for you to discover fun, which don't feel that they were crafted sort of in the sense of like, oh, the person's going to do this here, or this bit is going to be a race, or this bit's going to be a really sort of hairy platforming section. It feels that they made a place and the fun turned up because of these incredible mechanics where you can literally grab the world with each hand and climb up it. And it's it's just an absolute delight. And I would say Invisible Ink is one of those games where I think if you're a bit of an introvert, uh, I don't know why I think that, but I feel like I'm, I feel like I like it for a lot of (laughs) slightly introverted reasons. Whereas I think Grow Home is a game I'd recommend to anyone. I've been playing with my daughter and, and it's just absolutely captivating. It's everything I love about video games. And it's just, what an insanely beautiful piece of work. Ubisoft's best game in years. Um, I was going to say, like, the climbing of Grow Home, it makes me, the climbing mechanic of Grow Home, it makes me think of, I can't remember the name, but everyone kind of knows of it. It's that Xbox Live indie game that came out on the 360. As I remembered after getting off the phone with Donlan, it was Mount Your Friends. Oh, it's about yeah. like the Bennett Foddy games, like Quop. And, and stuff like that mm. there's, a, there's a load of games where like so there's a load of games where you have very very elaborate control schemes based around sort of human body like Quop is where you're trying to run and you're trying to control his limb or there's um, there is Surgeon Simulator where you're controlling each of the fingers of a hand and Grow Home initially feels like that it initially feels like oh because you're controlling each hand independently it feels like something which is trying to encumber you with this with this this intentionally awkward control scheme but that's not the truth at all it's it's actually the most elegant control after about five minutes of playing with it you were just scampering up everything it's really second nature it feels so tangible you really feel that you're grabbing at this world and pulling yourself up over it and it's just ah have you played it i've not played it yet but i know it's been on plus and i know i have it on my download list you Stop what you're doing. Stop talking to me and go and play it. And it's, I think it'll be a lovely Christmas game as well. A lovely sort of three hours away over Christmas. It'll just, it'll, it'll transport you, Cullen. It'll take you somewhere special and lovely and festive. So, so I recommend it. Twenty fifteen has been a dramatic year for Hideo Kojima and Metal Gear as a whole. Speculation on the series creator and his relationship with his then employer Konami had been rampant throughout the year, beginning with the removal of his name from the box art of Metal Gear Solid 5, the removal of PT from the PlayStation Store, 
and the cancellation of the game that PT was actually teasing, Silent Hills. It then reached a fever pitch in early December when Jeff Keighley did this at the Game Awards after Metal Gear Solid 5 won an award at the ceremony. As you noticed, uh, Hideo Kojima is not here with us uh, tonight, and I want to tell you a little bit about that. Uh, Mr. Kojima had every intention of uh, being with us tonight, uh, but unfortunately he was uh, informed by a lawyer representing Konami uh, just recently that uh, he would uh, not be allowed to uh, travel to uh, tonight's awards ceremony to uh, accept um, any awards. It's, uh, he's still on an employment contract, and it's, uh, it's disappointing, and it's, it's inconceivable to me that a, an artist like Hideo would not be allowed to come here and celebrate with his peers and uh, his fellow uh, teammates uh, such an incredible game as Metal Gear Solid V. A few weeks after it, it was official. Kojima's employment contract with Konami was terminated, and almost immediately after, literally the day after, it was announced he was re-establishing a newly independent Kojima Productions with the first game from the studio being published by Sony exclusively for PlayStation 4 and PC. 2015 has been a dramatic year, but also an exciting one for Metal Gear. Here's Alan Williamson to talk of Metal Gear Solid. No, not that one. The original Metal Gear Solid. We promise, it makes sense. Kinda. Hi, I'm Alan Williamson and my favourite game of 2015 is Metal Gear Solid. No, not Metal Gear Solid 5, the other one, the original Metal Gear Solid. This year I completed Metal Gear Solid for the first time. When listening to other episodes of my favourite game, I became acutely aware that I'd never played Wind Waker or Snake Eater, I'd never finished Grim Fandango or Final Fantasy VII, and that was as tragic as other listeners who had never played Sonic 3 and Knuckles. So this year, I shunned most new games in favour of the old, and I completed in no particular order... The Last of Us... Huzzah! Sorry... Carry on. Metal Gear Solid and its sequel, Super Metroid, Metroid Fusion, Metroid Zero Mission, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Zelda A Link Between Worlds, and I'm now sailing the seas of Wind Waker. I also played Super Mario World, but I was terrible at it. My favourite of these was Metal Gear Solid. It's strange to play through such an iconic game for the first time. It feels familiar, you know, the face that launched a thousand memes. It's like when you watch a musical for the first time and realise you already know the tunes through Simpsons parodies. But while you may think you know Metal Gear Solid and its legendary boss fights, stirring soundtrack, the cutscenes that stretch out into infinity, as the philosopher Morpheus said, there's a difference between knowing the path and walking the path, and the snowy fortress of Shadow Moses Island is just as exciting to navigate in 2015 as it was in 1998. I love how the game gives you enough guidance to Master Snake's abilities without holding your hand too much. I love the predictability of the guards, how every boss becomes a puzzle rather than a mere war of attrition, how the story juxtaposes po-faced military jargon with absurdity and comedy. I love how the PlayStation can barely keep up, and the muddy, shuddering polygons serve to enhance the experience of exploring Shadow Moses rather than degrading it. In an era obsessed with resolutions, frame rates, and graphical trickery, playing a game where you hide a cardboard box man inside another cardboard box feels like a quiet act of rebellion. Make no mistake that Metal Gear Solid still holds up today, and if you're yet to play it, you should do yourself a favour and check it out. Although you may want to have a book at hand, since the cutscenes are as long and often as tedious as you have feared. Classic games are like classic films. Exploring the history of gaming changes our opinions of new releases. Having played Metal Gear Solid, its sequel Sons of Liberty has new context. It's a smart evolution of the stealth mechanics of the first game, but also ramps up pompous cutscenes and codec sequences. Stripped of hyperbole by the ravages of time, we're able to better appreciate whether these games are actually good or not. And for the record, I think Metal Gear Solid 2 is a great game, but that Metal Gear Ray fight can get in the bin. I did play some new games in 2015. Downwell is a fiendishly clever roguelike platformer. Her Story is a smart new take on old interactive movies. And I'd consider talking about both of these. But this Christmas, why not shun Fallout 4 and play Fallout 2 instead? 
Why play Star Wars Battlefront when you can play TIE Fighter? The truth is that Metal Gear Solid is the one gaming experience of the year that has stayed with me the most, and for that reason it's my favourite game of 2015. My name is Dan Sito and I am the Square Enix Japan Studios Community Manager and I want to say that my favourite game of 2015 is Final Fantasy VII. Wait, what? Which did come out again on PS4 this year, so technically it counts, although I know it kind of doesn't because it's not a brand new game. Too bloody right it doesn't count, we just did an entire episode on it. Uh, But since it was released in 2015... I want to say that's my favourite game, because it is my favourite game of all time. Uh, but if that is frowned upon, uh, which I'm sure it is, um, I'm going to say my other favourite game of 2015 is Rock Band 4. Oh, thank Christ for that. I love the Rock Band franchise. I think it's amazing like the it's an unparalleled co-op experience it's, you know it's a ton of fun and if you were to ask me what my top 10 favorite games of all time are a rock band game would definitely make it somewhere in that list um and the rock band franchise is one that gets better with every iteration you know two is better than one three was better than two and i believe four is better than three it's not the big revolutionary step forward for the franchise that maybe some of the other games were um, but there's enough tweaks and enough changes in there to make the whole experience that much more engrossing that it's my favourite uh, game in the Rock Band franchise number four that is is my favourite game my favourite Rock Band game in the Rock Band franchise and yeah it's just really great to have friends over and just jam out again. I mean, it's been quite a while since, you know, since Rock Band 3, I suppose. Um, and you remember back in the day, well, let's say back in the day, it wasn't really that long ago, but back in the day, you know, when people used to have rock band parties and guitar hero parties, you know, get a bunch of friends around uh, just to come jam out and just have a good time. And it's really, really great to have that again and just be able to just come, you know, play in a band. And, and just mess around with your friends. It's an incredible feeling. It's incredible fun. And, you know, I have to admit that I do play rock band uh, on my own as well. And it's just great to a great way to experience music. It's great to play along. It's great to listen to. And it's just great. And it's great fun. And Rock Band 4 has, as I mentioned before, enough tweaks to make it the best version, in my opinion. You know, it's just little things like the way... You can get into songs much faster, you know, when you're playing continuously. The fact that, you know, it's less loading times. Uh, the new solo system just means that you can just... It gives you more opportunity to dick about. And it's just, yeah, it's just great fun, either on your own or even better with friends. And I think, um, yeah, it's just a ton of fun that I think more people should play and enjoy. In August 2015, Brighton-based independent developer Chinese Room released what was, or is, one of the most haunting games I've ever had the pleasure of playing. Everybody's Gone to the Rapture was the beautiful yet melancholic tale of love and loss, 
as mentioned in season 3 by Bethesda Sarah Wallach talking of the game as one of her honourable mentions initially I thought it was a game I'm not going to spoil the story too much because it is quite new Yeah. about future problem sci- and it feels at the beginning a little sci-fi and some of the marketing assets that were created it made it feel like it had a very heavy sci-fi element to it but it the more you play it and as you learn each character's story as you go through it, it just becomes about love mm-hmm. in all these different forms. A mother, a religious man, a mother, a child, a daughter, a boyfriend, a partner. And it's the most beautiful story about love and loss I think I've ever played. Mm-hmm. And it's been a, a rough year. I would say we, both of us have had loss yeah. in life. And it was a game that really spoke to me about, oh my goodness, like what am I... This is this is what it feels like, and for me, I was already excited to play Rapture well before it came out. I'd been interested to get my hands on it since its original Gamescom 2013 reveal. The premise just looked intriguing, but the game took on a whole new personal resonance when it did come, just before the year anniversary of my mum passing away. For me, it's a game that easily managed to fit into my own personal top three for this year, without question. And everyone, can we please just give all the awards to Jessica Curry for her amazing soundtrack for the game? Can we just do that? Please? Anyways, I digress. Here's my good friend Tom Bramwell of Riot Games to talk of Rapture as his favourite game of 2015. Hi, my name is Tom Bramwell. I work at Riot Games in Europe. Before I joined Riot, I worked at Eurogamer for 15 years, um, the last seven of them as Editor-in-Chief. And my favourite game of 2015 is Everybody's Gone to the Rapture. I often find the place that a game transports me to is the most important thing about it. If I don't connect with a place on some level, I won't last very long. I remember lots of my friends cooing appreciatively about Shadow of Mordor, for instance, but I got bored of it within a couple of hours. Everyone was telling me about these cool experiences they'd had with the game's systems, but to me it was just grey soup and rubble. I never felt any sense of connection with it, and I quickly lost interest. I'm also pretty introverted, um, much happier at home with my wife and son than I am out and about being social. I'm the sort of person who enjoys holidays mostly in hindsight, um, and dreads going on them. But I love the little things um, about life. I like knowing that I've done the washing up. I like sitting on the top deck of a bus when it's raining. And I like the idea of listening to the archers, although I've never actually listened to it because my wife hasn't forgiven them for killing off someone called Nigel. In a lot of ways, Everybody's Gone to the Rapture was the perfect game for me. For a start, it's set in a picturesque English village that has been completely deserted. As you wander around exploring it, you encounter all these little domestic situations that have been inexplicably interrupted. Signs half-painted, tissues crumpled on the edge of a couch, candles lit on the end of church pews, that sort of thing. There's a sort of magical orb thing floating around that you follow, and it allows you to listen to conversations that have taken place in the recent past between the absent residents. As you amble around from village pub to farmyard barn to family campsite, the idea is that you start to piece together what's happened by listening to these exchanges and contemplating your surroundings. It's fun trying to figure out what caused everyone to disappear, but the source of the mystery wasn't the thing that made Everybody's Gone to the Rapture my favourite game of 2015. As I settled into its gentle rhythm, I went into every building I could find, reading the menus behind the bar, or the names of the periodicals on a waiting room table, or just admiring the way the afternoon light was refracted through frosted glass. I don't think I was all that motivated by the story details that these things were or were not revealing. It was just nice to be visiting a very particular kind of English country village and inhabiting that space for a while. It's completely convincing. The people who put this thing together definitely know what it's, night, uh, what it's like when you get up in the morning and say, OK, let's go and visit an, a, a National Trust house. I kind of wish there had been a gift shop after the end credits. I should also say that the acting was superb. I don't think it's a wild generalisation to say that most video games struggle to present convincing characters, especially women, but the people in Everybody's Gone to the Rapture were quickly real to me. By the end of the game, I cared much less about why they had all disappeared and instead I felt all sorts of emotions about the events in their lives and the things that they had done in their final hours. 
I'm a simple person um, who often misses incredibly obvious things about story and games, so I will leave it to better people to explore the themes and ideas the game played with. But I found myself thinking about it all in quiet moments for days and weeks afterwards. Like I said, it was the perfect game for me. It's a game where you wander slowly around in a village, tracing the outlines of a peculiar event in the lives of a bunch of pretty ordinary people. You never feel under pressure, and nothing really happens in the usual whiz-bang sense of the word. It's a game that leaves you alone with your, uh, a mixture of your thoughts and other people's thoughts. And for me, that really was a kind of heaven. My name is Jordan Erica Weber. I write and talk about video games for a living, and I'm conflicted about my favourite game of 2015. I'm conflicted because I feel pulled in a load of different directions, like I should pick something quote-unquote hardcore to prove my skill, or else some obscure indie game to gently hint at some kind of superiority. I'm conflicted because what I've actually chosen is a PC port of a game that already came out on mobile last year, a game that couldn't really be more pink and thus basically the epitome of what society currently perceives as girly. I'm conflicted because I know these things shouldn't matter, and I wonder how much of my decision to call this game my favourite of the year is basically me just trying to tell this bundle of concerns to fuck off. My name is Jordan Erica Weber, and my favourite game of 2015 is Kitty Powers Matchmaker. I think what drew me to first play Kitty Powers Matchmaker when it was on show at EGX last year was, again, because it was the kind of game I was supposed to hate. If you're a man listening to this and you haven't fast-forwarded through the soliloquy already, then take a moment to thank your chosen authority that you haven't had to deal with the roller coaster ride of learning how exactly you're supposed to feel about things that are coded feminine. The journey from dressing in pink to refusing to wear skirts to realising that actually the point is to just dress however you want. From playing with dolls, to scorning parents who buy them for their daughters, to realising that prioritising toys coded masculine is just another form of prejudice. I feel like every female feminist I know has gone through that phase where you tell people with pride that most of your friends are guys and you get on better with men and male activities anyway. The people working the Kitty Powers Matchmaker stand at EGX last year were totally canny about all of this. Not what you expected, they asked me, knowingly. At Video Brains December 2015, I gave a whole talk about how Kitty Powers Matchmaker is more than it appears. I don't want to just repeat all of that now because there'll be video at some point and I'm going to make everyone watch it, but I do want to emphasise what makes this game so, so great because, oh my goodness, I've spent far too much time rambling about why part of me feels like I should have just picked Fallout 4 instead. As you can probably guess from the title, Kitty Powers Matchmaker is a dating sim, but instead of trying to get a digital girlfriend or boyfriend for yourself, you play as an employee at a matchmaking agency, run by the titular Kitty Powers, who awesomely is the drag persona of the developer, Richard Frank. Your job is to find your clients a perfect match. Well, a match that's good enough. If you listen to series 3 of my favourite game, you'll know that my favourite game series of all time is The Sims and all its sequels, even if Johnny made me pick just one. No regrets! I just love games that take scenarios from everyday life and abstract them into game mechanics. The Sims is obviously the epitome of that, basically trying to cover as much of things like relationships, jobs and capitalism as it can, but because Kitty Powers Matchmaker is just about one aspect of life, dating, it can go into a lot of depth. Kitty Powers Matchmaker lets you give your client a makeover, choose the restaurant for the date, pick topics of conversation, decide how honest they should be, and navigate all sorts of tricky dating dilemmas like what to do if you run into an ex, or how many times you should hang out before you make it official. A lot of these aspects of dating are represented by minigames, which might seem frivolous, but when you think about it, and you might not want to think about it too much, is actually a kind of realistic way to represent the whole dating thing. Have you ever had anyone ask you to tell them something about yourself, and found yourself frantically trying to remember something anything interesting that you've ever done in your entire life. In Kitty Powers Matchmaker, that's represented by a memory game where you turn over cards to find a pair that make up an interesting story. Flirting is a quick game of rock, paper, scissors that's triggered when the candidate gets something in their eye and your client thinks they're winking. So basically, it's a competition you get into by accident. Too real, right? There's even a game where you have to guess how long to apply deodorant for to make sure the client smells just right. At the core of the simulation in Kitty Powers Matchmaker is the procedural system that produces the clients and their potential dates, um, who, as I think I've mentioned, are called candidates, which is a word I might start using for people I fancy in real life. Every person in the game has a more or less prestigious job, a list of interests, 
personality made up of five binaries like extroversion versus introversion, a bad habit, a guilty pleasure that's basically an interest that seems out of character for them, and preferences as far as the gender and physical appearance of the other person. You have to take all of these things into consideration when choosing a match and deciding how your client should behave. So like someone whose personality includes traditional, they'll want you to pay when it comes time to play the pachinko minigame that determines how you'll split the bill. But if they're experimental, they'll want to pay instead. As I said in my video brains talk, Kitty Power's matchmaker manages to make a bundle of simple mini games share a genuinely important lesson about dating. Pay attention. Be present. Listen to what the other person is saying. Consider their wants as well as your own. This incredibly pink cartoony port of a mobile game, it might not have the CGI sex scenes of Mass Effect or Dragon Age, but its approach to romance is so much more realistic. And so much more fulfilling, for me anyway. You'll have to try it yourself and let me know what you think. No, seriously, I think everyone should play this game. So if you want an easy win, go play it and um, tweet me that you've done so and I will congratulate you on a choice well made. Thanks for listening to me go on. Hope your 2016 is awesome. My name is Ed Stern, and my game of the year is Gravity Ghost. Oh my goodness, it's been a weird year for games. Um, both ends of the market. I'm not even sure what that means. I mean, like, by different team sizes. I think there have been some amazing games made by very small teams, sometimes the single designers, and some amazing stuff done by huge, great, big AAA mega studios, which is uh, uh, all good choice. This is a great time to be a gamer. But yeah, no, uh, game of the year for me has to be Gravity Ghost by Erin Swink Robinson. Uh, she's just been announced as next year's creative director at the Games Masters program at UC Santa Cruz, so congratulations to her and good hire by them. Um, it's a simply beautiful game. Um, it's one of those games that just wouldn't be better if it, was, if it had a hundred times the budget or hundreds more artists on it. It's a beautifully handmade, hand-scripted, hand-drawn game. Uh, it's Gravity Ghost. You're a ghost and you play with gravity. I mean, it's all, it's all there in the title. Um, and it could have just been a series of physics puzzles. It could have just been, you know, a points accruing kind of solve the gravity problem. And it's so much more than that. It's so beautifully drawn by Erin herself. It's so beautifully animated. It's clunky. I mean, it looks like it was, in the best way, illustrated by a child, or at least for a children's book. And they make that work so well. Um, there's a phrase I overuse, which is, find out what's clunkiest about your game and really make that meaningful. And it's perfect. It's tone. It's mechanically perfect. It's a really good puzzle game. But it's tonally perfect as well. Um, the writing's really good. The voice acting is fantastic. The music is lovely, by Ben Prunty, who did the music for FTL on, a, on, a, on a Faster Than Light, on a similarly cosmic theme. Um, it's so... I, I'm trying to think of a way to talk about the writing or the story without spoiling it, and I don't think I can. Uh, please do take the time to check it out. It's an amazing world you get to enter, or series of worlds. And I can't, off the top of my head, or actually having thought about it for a while, think of a game as elegant that makes its mechanic so meaningful. There's a, a remarkable turn there's a big reveal about what you've been doing or the significance of the things you've been doing um which you forget about because they're so delightful you know it, it it's it's such an involving game and it's so tough to get that right i mean post you know bioshock how are you going to do that but it's just beautiful and it, and and it, i think it's got genuine emotional force it surprised and delighted me i felt very involved and very moved by it it was a it's a tone that games just don't seem to touch very often. It's beautiful. I'd be happy to recommend it to absolutely anyone, uh, as I do to you. And that is why it is my game of my game of the year, Gravity Ghost. It's finished at Sunderland. Manchester United have done all they can. That Rooney goal was enough for the three points. Manchester City are still alive here. Balotelli, Aguero! I 
swear you'll never see anything like this ever again. So watch it. Drink it in. They've just heard the news at the Stadium of Light. Two goals in added time for Manchester City to snatch the title away from Manchester United. Stupendous! There is honestly nothing like the sport of football. The drama, the passion, no sport can touch it. On May 13th, 2012, Sergio Aguero scored for Manchester City the winning goal against Queen's Park Rangers in the most dramatic of fashion by coming back from 2-1 down to win 3-2 and win City's first championship in 44 years, their first title in the Premier League era. One that almost let slip through their hands, not just because of their potential loss, but also their closest challenger, Manchester United, doing all they had to do in winning against Sunderland 1-0 and hope results elsewhere, in this case QPR beating City, went for them. It almost did. And as a United fan, it still hurts to have Martin Tyler squeal Aguero down my ears. Anyways, not many video games, at least the sports genre, have given us close to that feeling. At least, that was until this year. Well, sloppy defense, though, coming from Urban. Did not he get that one completely, though. 3-3, three, three, we're going to overtime. Four, I don't know about that. That ball is up. Three, five under trying to make a play. Kronovi just needs to let it touch the floor, but Gambit's going to be there as well. Tries to keep it in play. He goes, Kyle! 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 Oh, no! Kyle! Kyle! What? Oh, my goodness gracious me! What a finish! Wow! We thought they should play for I, overtime. They played for the win. Kyle Mask, Fireburner, and Gambit are going to be your victors tonight. 4-3. The clip you just heard was of an MLG competitive series featuring two teams, Cosmic Aftershock and Urban, with the former coming back in the third and final best of three match series to win the final game 4-3 in the dying seconds after Urban had taken an early 3-0 lead to take a 2-1 victory in the best of three series. The reaction to that crazy ending made me think of that crazy 30 second period at the end of the City QPR game and also shows how amazing the game is, not just as a fun fallacy but also at a serious potential to be an esports flag bearer along the likes of League of Legends and Dota 2, if done right anyways. So what is the game in question? Here's John Brady to tell you all about it as his favourite game of 2015. <laughs> My name is John Brady, sometime games writer and freelance photographer, and my game of the year in 2015 is Rocket League. Let's not beat around the bush here. Football generally is rubbish. 20 men or women run across some grass, generally in circles, for an hour and a half kicking an inflated bit of leather, while two other men or women try and catch said bit of leather, and if they don't catch it, then some of the men or women get points. It's about as appealing to me as a urine infection. But then, a pocky American developer called Psyonix came along and thought, what if we just shook that up a bit? As Americans, they are the perfect candidate to look past the fanaticism and the cultesque worship that's attached to football over here and break it down to the parts that make it great. And then, after understanding that, they took away the 20 sweaty men or women and the two less sweaty men or women and replaced them with a handful of cars. And then they stuck rockets to them. Rocket League is the game that made me love football, and it's got nothing to do with Gary Neville or Ryan Giggs or Jermaine Defoe or anyone else I've briefly read about while scrolling past the sports section of a news website. It's because, for the first time, I finally understand football. I understand the rush of running with the ball while driving with it, in a mad dash towards the goal after spotting a hole in the defence. I understand the thrill of a last minute dive to prevent a seemingly unstoppable goal. And I understand the thrill of leaping into the air, sticking on your rocket boosters and whacking the ball into the bottom corner while performing an uncountable number of front flips. Well, maybe that last one doesn't quite help, but you get my point. 
Rocket League thrilled me so much this year because it requires nothing more than practice to become a master. Everybody is on a level playing field and nothing you do to your car, van, buggy or ice cream truck or DeLorean will make it any better than the next man's. The rules stay the same but the number of players might change and that's it. You're left to tiptoe onto the pitch, awkwardly bumbling about, missing the ball by miles as you misjudge jumps and cringing as balls you were sure should have been saved go soaring past your awkward attempts to knock them away. And then, one day, like an Inverness Caledonian Thistle victory over Celtic, it unexpectedly clicks out of nowhere. And it's glorious. Not just because you're sending balls goalward with an apparently godlike ease, or catching balls in the air with deft, psychic premonition, but because you made your way there all by yourself. Like the earliest of games, your Donkey Kong, Asteroids, Space Invaders, the only thing holding you back is yourself. And along the way, you've learned to appreciate the meaning of working in a team, of hanging back to defend while someone else goes up front, of those miracle strategies that work with a complete stranger over the internet, using nothing more than a preset message which screams, I've got it. You embrace the glory, like a third division club winning the League Cup. And then, if only for a moment, you begin to understand what all that fuss is about when there's a game on down the pub. Timmons and my favourite game of 2015 is Ark Survival Evolved. It's an early access base building survival game with dinosaurs. It's also the best role playing game I've ever played. The normal game is your usual survival. You wake up in a strange land, you get killed by the local wildlife or whatever players happen to be around. Eventually you learn to tame some dinosaurs and soon you're running around on raptors, stegosauruses and even a T-Rex. Every few weeks the devs add more dinosaurs and more features to the game and it's become so much more than just fighting and base building. I play on a dedicated roleplay server called Twitch RP, and it has, at last count, over 70 streamers and Twitch users playing on it. Players have set up tattoo parlors, adventure parks, a school, and so much more. I play a journalist and a poop farmer in the game. I sell fertilizer and report on stories happening in the game world on a site called TwitchRP.news. No, it's a real thing. Like, the best part about it is that the other players, it's unscripted. Planned, but unscripted is how I describe it. So I can just rock up to someone, and they already know their character. So I just ask them a few questions about something that's happened and let them go. It's great. Now the support from, support from devs has been incredible. In the past few months they've added purely cosmetic items like tables, chairs, and painting canvases so we can decorate our bases, build a castle for example. There's a food roleplay system that allows you to create custom food, so I go around... One of my friends made a thing called Pucan Pie around Thanksgiving. Because I'm a poop farmer, of course it, can, it holds Weefs' secret ingredient, human feces. Now there are also restaurants popping up all over the server and people are taking their characters out on dates, others are declaring wars and taking prisoners, and I'm pretty sure there's a zombie infection spreading from the frontier town that a group of players built. It's basically a soap opera that you can watch from 70 different perspectives and talk to the actors while they're actually in the game. I love it. Dear listener, I'm about to ask you the most important question of mankind and I need you very carefully to listen to this question and answer it very carefully because there's a lot riding on this question. Pay attention. Here it is. Are you a kid or are you a squid?
I underestimated Splatoon big time, like massively. The first massive new IP from Nintendo in quite some time. The concept was neat on paper, but I'd felt it'd be more of a fallacy I'd spend more time than 2-3 to three hours with if given the game. Instead, what I played was a rarity in itself. One of the very few games these days where I've played a multiplayer suite, enjoyed it, and this is the rare bit, actually stayed around in it for a while yet compared to most multiplayer games. In fact, to help further my point, I've barely touched the single player aspect of the game. Most of the time I've spent with the game this year has been with the multiplayer. Like I said, I really underestimated Splatoon, but I was wrong about it, and I'm glad I was, because it really is such a fun game. Anyway, I digress. This isn't about me. Yet. So let's have two folks tell you why Splatoon is their favourite game of 2015. First up, her story creator, Sam Barlow. Hi, I'm Sam Barlow. I'm the developer of Her Story. My favourite game of 2015 is Nintendo's Splatoon. Such a gorgeous game. For the longest time, people have been saying that there should be a Mario paintball. You know, do for shooting what Mario Kart did for racing. And we knew it would be good if it ever happened. But I think Splatoon ended up being better than that, better than we could have imagined. First is the shooting, the way the paint guns feel. The way you have to use the gyro to aim, it really makes it feel like you're arcing paint, like you're slopping this stuff around. The sound it makes, the schlup of it, is just perfect. And the whole mechanic of having to paint the map, the way that allows players to go off and do something that isn't necessarily sharpshooting, but feels like it's contributing, that's great. And the way you can just glance at the minimap and know where the action is, where you can make a difference. I could talk about all the online stuff, about how Nintendo has handled the rollout of new features and content, but the thing that really, the thing I really love about this game is the movement. You have what is essentially a fast-paced third-person Metroid. The squid form is nothing more than a morph ball in disguise with the awesome spider ball power that lets you climb up walls. You have the ball cannons, the spider rails, all the different enemy types. As a die-hard Metroid Prime fan, it's amazing to see how well this game works as a proof of concept of a third-person Metroid. So as much as my kids loved the multiplayer, I was really into the single player levels. They really scratched that Metroid itch. I would love to see some single player DLC for this game. I haven't even talked about the music, or the visuals, or the fact that Nintendo have made a game for kids that doesn't condescend. It doesn't in any way speak down to them, or feel dumbed down. And this game, more than any, really speaks to how Nintendo continue to be their absolute masters. And the name is great too. Splatoon. Hello. My name's Andrew Smith, I'm the Managing Director and Founder at uh, Spilt Milk Studios, and my favourite game of the year has got to be Splatoon. Splatoon. What's not to like? It's Nintendo's freshest new game in years and years. Uh, it tries some really interesting, borderline dangerous things uh, in the modern climate. Um, and it's just the most colourful, over-the-top, fun, rewarding shooter I think I've ever played. Um, I love everything about it, basically. The, the graphics are stunning. Um, it, you, you, you couldn't look at it and think, oh, that's definitely a Wii U game. You know, it just looks, you know, fresh, interesting, modern. Uh, it looks like a Pixar film, basically, brought to life. Um... I love the soundtrack. I think the sort of crazy Japanese rock inspired and pop inspired stuff with the with the squids yelling and screaming and, and gargling their way through the songs is, is absolutely brilliant. And I love the map design. Um, I think that obviously the core of the game being the you know, splatting everything with ink and then using that to travel around 
informs the map design in a way uh, for a shooter that just hasn't been explored uh, in a satisfactory way until now. And it takes Nintendo to do it. You know, we've seen a lot of shooters in the past try destructible environments and all this kind of thing, and ultimately it, it has a sort of a, a very light impact on, on gameplay in games like Battlefield. Um, or they use, you know, big sort of switch style A to B style um, levolution stuff where, where a whole level will just change from one state to another. But the idea that you can paint almost any surface with your gun and not only are you scoring points, you're actually changing the way that you and your team and the enemy team will be uh, playing in that area is just... It's a stroke of genius and it's typical Nintendo, you know. Um, I just... I love reading about all the ways that the all, all the prototyping that they did. I love the fact that it took them ages to make it. I love the fact that it's a really young and interesting team, like kind of a, a lot of new talent in Nintendo who got to make it. Um, and I think it's just about the best representation of why I, I think Nintendo is the best developer currently making games. Uh, it's 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 almost a shame it's not on other platforms. I'll say that. Um, you know, it'd be interesting to see what it would do with a, a truly giant market, but uh, I think we'll see ideas from it expanding outwards into other games in quite interesting ways. Um, on the downside, you know, the social stuff isn't so great. You can't just, you know, chat away to your, your mates, and the integration on the Wii U with your friends list, you know, is always going to be a bit awkward, but um, the, that's all kind of offset by the, the DLC plan that they had. Basically, it beats even Mario Kart 8's um, attempts, basically just free content, constant drip feed, um, always something interesting to go back to, and um, probably the most interesting social experiment I've ever seen is the uh, is the, the weekend events, where you, you choose a side uh, on, a, on a kind of a whimsical debate, and then sign up for that team, and then all of your points and wins go towards it. Oh, it's just amazing, I'm not going to be able to fit it all in, but I think I'll stop around here, I guess. The only other thing to mention is um, the way that you don't even have to be good at shooting people. You can just shoot the environment and genuinely, genuinely have a support role that uh, that, that positively affects your team's uh, standing. And uh, I just think it's magic. Um, and that's what games are all about, isn't it? Magic. Hello, my name is Carly Bellucci and I am a freelance writer and my favorite game of 2015 is Soma. Soma for me was probably the best game of the year because not only was it probably one of the most unique and smart concepts that I've seen, but it was also probably one of the most heart-wrenching and terrifying. It, like, it was a game that where I basically experienced every emotion at one point or another, whether it was, you know, tr heartbreak or glee or you know sadness or terror it was it's a, it covers the whole gamut of human experience which is so interesting because it's a whole game about human experience and what that really means and i don't there are very few stories i've seen i've seen or experienced that even delve into that kind of thing let alone do it so well and the thing about soma is that it's not afraid to ask the hard questions. It's not afraid to be like, okay, so, you know, what does murder mean to you? And we're now we're going to put you in a different situation. What does murder mean here? And this is a completely different situation. What does murder mean here? And how do you feel here? And as compared to how you feel now? And it's all just so like thought provoking and so confusing but at the same time it's also very clear and straightforward because at one point you're like you know S Simon you should know what's going on by now because everything's being spelled out for you but you're also you also don't want to believe it just as much as Simon doesn't want to believe it and and it does and it takes so many risks in not only in its character design by not only you know making Simon essentially a man in a woman's body and then later a 
man in a robot's body and yeah he's he's a man without a body but it's in but it, and it's a monster designs and it's like use of body horror it did not it did not hesitate at all to you know just go there to disturb you to freak you out to ask you questions and that's what i think makes the game so successful it it tried to do a thing and it took risks and it went for it and that's all that really matters is that it did it successfully and what i love the most about soma as a horror game fan if you go if you take out all the you know the the thought provoking stuff and all of the you know, the great storytelling it's a good horror experience just in terms of its usage of body horror and how appropriate it is to use it in a game that's about what it means to be human and it's just all so wonderfully constructed and you know it's not a perfect game by any means um technically it has some problems but it's beautiful it's gorgeous the acting is really good and just like if you break down every element of this game there's something to praise about almost all of them and and I've already like I've played the game once I've watched two other playthroughs of it and I love seeing people react to it and talk about it. it's it's something I haven't seen since you know experiencing Silent Hill 2 for the first time and watching people experience that game for the first time and you know from my episode of my favorite game you'll know how much I love that game and so my think is one of the closest things I've played to, just in terms of, you know, just feel and atmosphere to Silent Hill 2. So I think that that's why that I had to eventually choose it as my favorite game. Earlier in the episode, you heard Eurogamer's Chris Donlan bend the rules of this episode and pick two games as his favourites from this year. As you heard earlier, he went into Grow Home from Ubisoft Reflections, and now we go into his other pick, Clay Entertainment's strategic stealth map Invisible Ink. I started out by asking Chris why that stood out for him this year. Invisible Ink is this um, extraordinary game from Clay, who are fast becoming just one of the great developers i think they're up there with for axis for me and all of their games are really precisely crafted and really meticulous and beautiful and compact and they're all quite different they're all sort of evolutions on a theme and they, they never really they share preoccupations but they always take it in a really different direction so after doing a, a really elegant real-time stealth platformer um with uh mark the ninja Invisible Ink takes stealth into turn-based sort of isometric territory and it has you sort of infiltrating procedurally generated offices to kind of mix stuff and generally do in other megacorps. And it's just an absolutely beautiful clockwork universe they've created. How, uh, uh, endless... how, how, yeah, um, how does that switch from kind of um, action stealth to strategic stealth kind of help invisible it's all about it's all about space so they're very clear in showing you um what people can see so you have a really good sense of what your enemies can see and what they can't see and it encourages you to be really bold because you're living in this world in which there are there are no gray areas you know you're either hidden or you're not hidden and so you can you can really push it to the limit. You can you know that you can sneak right behind someone. Also, um, there's a load of things in it which just encourage you to to actually be stealthy rather than just sort of busting guns blazing. Because most of the time you're not killing people. You're sort of knocking them unconscious. And once you've knocked a guard unconscious, they're a total pain for the rest of the level. Because after three turns, they'll wake up again. 
unless you're standing on them. So by the end of like a level, there'll be I'll have three team people standing on three guards, and it's just not worth it. It's much better to be to kind of ghost every level. So it, it kind of it allows you to select the degree of um, trouble you want to cause yourself. So it's just a really, really elegant game. And, and the, the one thing I would say about it, which is amazing, is every level, even though it's procedurally created, has this incredible dynamic storytelling thing where you are constantly in a race to get to the exit at least if you play it like me you're constantly racing to get to the exit with no no bullets left and no no ideas left and every 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 level just ends with this mad scamper and you, you just really feel that you're earning each victory it is a beautiful game Hello there, My Favourite Game listeners. This is Matthew Reynolds from Season 2's Shemu episode, reporting in to tell you about my favourite game of 2015, which is Undertale. I'm a big fan of Japanese role-playing games, and Undertale is a game that celebrates them, but also refines and innovates and examines them in all kinds of interesting ways. So take the battle system, for example, which is central to the way you interact with the game's many monsters and characters, and it's both this traditional turn-based thing and also a collection of like live-action mini-games that change from one monster and character to the next. It's really interesting and, and unique. And visually it's this very old school thing, but it's also jam-packed with all kinds of smart visual gags and funny animations. And it's got this story that's really full of heart and also has some wonderful humour and all these, also these genuinely unsettling moments. And it's a story that kind of reacts to how you play in so many clever ways. Undertale is one of those games that really benefits from going in fresh, so I'm a bit kind of, you know, scant with the details, but a game is funny and is surprising and this is worth trying to go in blind. Um, but so to say, it's ended up being a game that I really couldn't stop thinking about after I finished playing it. Um, it's also a game that reminded me how much I enjoy uh, the role-playing game genre and games where you have worlds that you want to explore every nook and cranny of and learn about every secret. And Undertale has that in spades. If you're interested in my honourable mentions, then Life is Strange is a very, very close second. It was actually my first choice up until I played Undertale fairly recently. And in many ways I enjoy it for the same reasons, in that it's got this really compelling core cool concept and mechanics that keep you surprised throughout. Uh, the story that's really heartwarming and strange and interesting and a world that I just was happy to immerse myself in for long periods of time and uh, this cast of characters I really enjoyed talking to. Otherwise, I admittedly haven't delved into many of the big releases this year just because they're mainly like these huge big open world epic games like Batman and The Witcher and Fallout and they seem really good from what I've played but I just haven't had the time to really commit and play to them properly, uh, which is a bit of a shame. Uh, I did get kind of stuck into Metal Gear Solid 5 though, which was a really good, really good blast and uh, Otherwise, uh, I've been really getting into Bloodborne at the start of the year. Um, I'm a huge Dark Souls fan, and uh, this has been brilliant in all kinds of similar ways, but it excels me personally in a bunch of others. Uh, and then an honourable mention also goes out to Destiny, which has been my go-to game ever since it launched in September 2014, and I continue to get a ton of enjoyment from it. I just play it very regularly with a bunch of friends, and it's just really, really good. Um, the Taken King was a brilliant expansion as well. It righted a lot of wrongs and emphasised the points and the features that kind of made it so great in the first place. So, yeah, there's been all kinds of great experiences out this year, and I think uh, Undertale, ultimately, was the one that topped the list for me. Twenty fifteen has been a year of a few things in the games industry. One of them is that it's been a year of episodic games. Game of Thrones, Dreamfall Chapters, King's Quest, even Resident Evil got in the act with Revelations 2. But, as we begin to wrap up this special episode of My Favourite Game, our final two games were head and shoulders the best in its class, and Game of the Year candidates in their own right. First, a game that even non-fans of this particular series could get into, and I can vouch for that first hand. Here's series superfan Caitlin Tremblay to tell you all about Telltale's finest game since the first season of The Walking Dead, her favourite game of 2015. My 
name is Caitlin Tremblay, and my favourite game of 2015 is Tales from the Borderlands. If you listened to me speak in Season 2 of my favourite game, you may have heard me say I wasn't that into Tales after playing a bit of the first episode. I was wrong. Boy, was I ever wrong. Tales is a brilliant, fun, endearing, charming, and incredibly well-paced game. It will make you cry. Unless you're a robot. And if you're a robot, and you're not a loader bot or gorgeous, then I don't care. Okay, let me back up. Tales is great because it takes the adventure and gory glory found in the Borderlands franchise and has a whole ton of heart to it. A truckload of heart. More heart than my heart could handle. Borderlands, but specifically Pandora, is the perfect setting for this kind of game. Pandora is a world that is vibrant, teeming with all kinds of dangerous life, and is a perfect setting for an experienced vault hunter to Gunzerg in. As somebody who has played Borderlands 2 no less than 7 times, I mean it. It is a fun world to shoot and loot a lot of things in. You can be an expert at killing, and the world revels in this dirt- dirtiness. Nobody is a hero, nobody is really truly good, and everybody is just trying to stay alive. And what Tails does is take this cutthroat, vicious planet, and adds to it people who are inexperienced, way out of their depth, and forced to navigate it. And it doesn't make them magically experts at survival. The fight scenes in the game are delightful because you are so bad at fighting. You are not a vault hunter, and the combat in the game never lets you forget it. But it lets you learn and grow slowly in a very believable way. It is whimsical. Episode 4 has one has got to be one of my favorite scenes in any video game, book, movie, or song in existence. It is pure joy. For those who have, bl- for those who have played it, you know the scene I'm talking about. That finger gun fight. <laughs> That's all I have to say. I wept from joy. That episode also made me cry real tears for a character I didn't even realize I really liked that much. And then episode makes and then episode 5 makes you cry for characters you really do like that much. It is satirical, it is heartfelt, it is smart, and it is both earnest and tongue-in-cheek, and it never feels like it's lost control of what it wants to do. And there are queer women and women of color characters that don't just exist, they aren't treated as character caricatures or any differently from the male characters. And the main theme of the game is friendship. Friendship between all kinds of people. Friendship between women. Friendship between men and women. Friendship between men. Friendship between humans and robots. And friendship between robots. One of the biggest, most important lines from this game is, I am your friend. This game gets it. And that is why it is my favorite game of 2015. Needless to say, our final game in this special episode of My Favourite Game came out of nowhere. Not at all was it expected to be such a standout game, but yet, Life is Strange took a lot of people through an incredible and, at times, emotional journey. As Max, we got to see her deal with the trials and tribulations of being a teenager while dealing with that small, little, trivial matter of having the power to rewind time. No big deal. No big whoop. But as 10 Second Ninja and Kelsus in the Sky creator Dan Pierce discusses, don't nod sophomore effort was a lot more than just that. Hi, I'm Dan Pierce, I'm the game director at Full Circle Interactive, and my favourite game of 2015 is Life is Strange. I was reluctant to get excited about Life is Strange. My first impression of it, based on its announcement trailer, was that it looked like it was retreading the steps of Gone Home, albeit in a form that felt slightly pretentious, in a way that teenage fanfiction often is. While I do believe that this prediction wasn't exactly wrong, I do regret being so dismissive of it based on that first impression. Life is Strange certainly does share some DNA with Gone Home, one of my favourite games of all time. But whereas Gone Home was a story from the perspective of someone often underrepresented in games, as told through the lens of nostalgia, Life is Strange is a look at a wide range of people through a thoroughly contemporary lens. It's a game that doesn't make the best first impression. Initially it comes across as slightly pretentious, maybe a little simplistic and awkward, 
However, it's so earnest that it almost feels deliberate. There are layers to it that just aren't being explored yet, and you can feel that hidden depth beneath the surface as the end of episode 1 approaches. As the series goes on, more and more of these layers are peeled back to reveal a cast of characters who are sympathetic, flawed, and incredibly likeable, the protagonist Max perhaps being my favourite of the bunch. The game shows compassion and respect towards all of its characters, even the ones you wouldn't expect. By and large, any unlikable attributes that a character has is due to them being failed somewhere in their life, be it by another person or an unfortunate situation. Life is Strange desperately wants you to know that these people are fragile things who deserve love and respect. It wants to remind you how important and life-altering a person's teenage years can be and has the utmost admiration for young people who have or are having a tough time. It was only a few years ago that I was a teenager myself and it was with this in mind that I feel confident in saying that Life is Strange has maybe the most accurate depiction of modern teenagers I've seen in all of gaming. Its characters are clumsy, they showboat about the arty, nerdy junk that they like, and they wear their influences on their sleeve. I was a photography student at A level, and let me tell you, this game knows exactly what that is like. It's not just the adorable quirks of being a teenager that Life is Strange understands though. The issues that the characters are dealing with are grounded and relatable. Without going into too many details, I know or have known people who have gone through very similar dark periods to the game's cast. Being put back in Max's position as the friend who wants to help but maybe doesn't know how was at first disconcerting, but it quickly became quite reassuring. The game understands that position and is very sympathetic towards how difficult it can be for everyone involved. Life is Strange holding my hand through it and assuring me that I was doing the right thing is one of the most meaningful experiences that I've had the privilege of experiencing in any medium. A friend of mine, Christos Reed, expressed to me how glad he is that teenagers now have a game like Life is Strange and I have to agree. Life is Strange is the most important game that I've played all year for this reason, and it's a bonus that the game manages to be beautiful, earnest, funny, and sweet at the same time, all while having perhaps the best soundtrack that I've heard in a game ever. It's the first game that I've ever played that feels like it could genuinely be about me. In a year filled with admittedly fantastic, ginormous games about killing thousands upon thousands of things, it's so refreshing to play a game that's as good as Life is Strange, where the themes are instead about love and respect. The medium is better for it. As you've just heard over the past near 90 minutes, 2015 has been enriched with some absolutely incredible games. The industry is lucky for it and it goes without saying we thank every developer who put out a game this year who put blood, sweat and tears into their work. We're grateful to have played your games. 2016 looks set to be just as an amazing year as 2015 with some more fantastic games on the way. Uncharted 4. No Man's Sky, XCOM 2, Dark Souls 3, Deus Ex Mankind of Edit, and a ton, ton more. It's going to be an incredible year. As for my favourite game, all that can be said for now is that there's stuff coming. But I want to take this opportunity to thank you for your amazing support this year, whether just listening to the show or spreading the word of it. It's honestly, truly appreciated. I can't even begin to tell you how much it means to the show and me. So thank you. So before we go, we have one final contribution for this episode. And in fact, it's for the game you just heard. Actually, you're still hearing it now. But who's the person that's going to be giving it? My name is Johnny Cullen. I'm a writer who's written for the likes of Eurogamer, VG247, and official PlayStation Magazine UK among others. I'm also the presenter and producer of My Favourite Game. Hi. And My Favourite Game of 2015 is Life is Strange. If you had asked me 12 months ago, after seeing the first trailer of it, if I had seen Life is Strange not only a Game of the Year candidate, but would outright be in with an actually serious chance of winning it, 
I probably would have laughed at you. And by probably, I mean definitely would have laughed at you. Like Dan Pierce just said, I was also mostly dismissive of it too. But felt that maybe, just maybe, there was something lying underneath that showed it, it would have been a decent, if not a great standout game. I mean, it looked alright, but nothing incredible. I was shape it up to be a bit too tweeny for me, if that makes sense. And this is especially in a year where a new mainline numbered Metal Gear game is coming out. And this is a series that I had a lot of love for. And a series that had very big personal resonance with me. But yet, here we are at the end of 2015. We have a game that has had more heart, more emotion, and more originality than anything else this year. Remember Me was a unique idea and had some great stuff that fell short subsequently for me. But even I never expected doing our entertainment to bounce back from it and financial uncertainty at one point in the biggest and best possible way. Never have I played a game since The Last of Us, itself my favourite game, that made me full on cry to a game than Life is Strange did at numerous times in the season, but never more so than the ending. Even with its issues, including wonky dialogue and shoddy lipstick, it tells a wonderful story of two teenage girls growing up focusing on the little things that matter and more, facets of which I could relate to. As you will have just heard, I wasn't the only one. Plus, an absolutely incredible soundtrack that really picks its moments well throughout the season. Let's say for example, would the end of episodes 2 and 3 respectively have worked so well without local natives Mount Washington? Or Mogwai's kids will be skeletons? Especially Mogwai in episode 3. But if anything, Life is Strange should be remembered for dealing head on with serious issues and including them in a delicate and careful but thought provoking way. Suicide, bullying, depression to name but a few. Don't nod, and to a lesser extent Square Enix, deserve every single bit of praise their way for how they treated that. Its characters and the situations they face are also really well written and made with care and love. It made me resonate with them in a big way. As I said, even with its flaws, it's a game that has had more heart, soul and emotion than anything else this year. For me, it's the best game I've played since The Last of Us and has actually gotten into my own top 10 games of all time. I set it back in October writing about it on my blog as I have throughout the year, but I may as well make it official. Life is Strange is my favourite game of 2015, and I am so happy it is. I was so wrong to be so dismissive of it, but I am so happy that it is my game of the year, and I am also so happy that a game like Life is Strange exists. And that is it. Thanks for listening to my favourite game of 2015. And thank you for listening to my favourite game in 2015. And for the past year. Like I said before, I could not be more appreciative of your support. So thank you once again. We will be back in the new year with a brand new season. Until then, stay tuned for news on that new season by following at MFG Podcast on Twitter. You can also follow me on Twitter at Johnny Kong and liking us on Facebook at Facebook.com. Thank you again so much for your support. We will see you in the new year. Until then, have a fantastic, peaceful and happy 2016. Bye-bye.
Thank you.